Season 1, Ashkaba. The turn of a misfortune in a household is not all of a sudden. In the wooden cracks on the sheets throughout the hatchways and in, in the pleats of curtains, the dust covers everything, longing for the wind to release the scattered constituents of a lurking place. In the house of Idrissi's life was going on. The engraved wall clock with the covered pinnacles of birds and flowers, a piece of work by the carpenters of Bukhara, struck ten. Lera looked at her wristwatch. She set it forward and stood up. She walked away from the breakfast table and took the bread crumbs for the fish. Vahab, the son of household, gulped down the last sip of tea after pouring some from the Oja served teacup and stopped yawning, turned to Mrs. Edrisi. She is better today. The old lady moved the glasses on her nose, her eyes behind the glasses were dark blue. The fog descended down to the arcade, fretted the windows, turned around and faced pine and poplar trees. Down at the end from the corridor, there came the sound of washing the dishes. The tap water popped and turned around and then there was the bubbling of samovar. From time to time, Yovar coughed in the kitchen, sluggishly pulled his feet on the floor. The lady crossed her eyebrows. Poor man, growing old, lost his lung by smoking. Vahab leaned against the margins of table, stood up. I should go to the library. I read an article about the ruins of a city, Nessa. It was a magnificent place once, buried now. Mrs. Edrisi sighed. Plenty of them have been buried, and one day our city is going to be buried. Vahok closed his eyes, turned back, and walked away. The household were a kind of quiet in eating, drinking, walking, and talking. Vahok was thirty, but looked much older, thin and hunchback, a pale face, solemn and lightless eyes. He had studied at British boarding schools for any word or movement. He felt he felt the lashes of punishment on his back. He ate a little and took a shower before the noon before the noon clipped his nails every weekend and filed them. Below his eyes was bloated for the shortage of sleep. He stood across from the mirror, counted the strands of grey hair in a pile of soft and black hair. The other day he had twelve of them, all white. He didn't go out, always residing a shelter. Twice a month he dropped in Ashena bookshop. The man put aside some new books for him. Vahab knitted his eyebrows and with a tight mouth paid for them, straightly came back home. In the afternoon, if the weather was good, he would sit by the pool, open the fountains and look at the patterns and the flow of water. He remembered the past. His childhood was far away. Gradually, when it was getting dark, the dreams faded away. Birds flew in the garden. In the hot weather, female feeding cows at the end of Alpha Alpha Field were mowing. On the second floor, his elder aunt, Lera, sat behind the hatchway with her hand under a cheek, stared at the mulberry trees, clay loops, and faded attics uh, till the time they would turn on the lamps around and drew the curtains. She didn't turn on the lamp, but closed closed her eyes behind the dark dreamy drowned eyelids sometimes a blue and yellow pattern like flowers and silica glass expanded and amused her on the rocking chair granny leaned against the mahogany furniture of walnut trees rubbed the perfume on the back ears the acrid extract of jasmine appeared in the house once in a while she would see the dreadful figure of her late husband in a summer suit with a white bow and salt and pepper whiskers in a hoarse and throaty voice caused by tobacco and opium he whispered such a nice smell the time she stared into the dark the white phantom had gone then she heard the creaking hinges of the doors on the first story yovar was walking in the corridor he turned on the candelabra 
In the walls, it glared on the plaster molding, the leaves of wine trees, lotus flowers, and clusters of grapes. The wind moved the candelab candelabra and the chains squeaked. The rainbow prism glowed on the images of the carpet. The barfay the bifurcated winding stairs and bending balustrade all lipped around. The first had three uh, the first story had three corridors, a big anteroom, a library and four bedrooms. On the second story around the balustrade there were ten attached bedrooms. All except three were locked. In the morning when Bahab was tired of was tired of reading, leaning against the velvet cushion in the drawing room, half asleep and behind the flower pots, he listened to the creaking of the springs. There were some pillars with patterns turns of peacocks and parrots he put them under his elbow then he drank a cup of coffee and lit a cigarette staring at the water drops he yawned there was a slight pain in his bones shaking his legs he pondered into the past he was dreaming rahila his aunt who had died young of a strange fever after her death mrs edrisi's hair had grown white overnight Fahab was ten at that time she was engaged to a broad-shouldered stout man with big eyes and a moorish face a widower who was a grand landowner called mayed people said that he lived in a mansion and had a lot of horses in the stable in pompous circumstances he came they wanted to buy his chestnut horse for three thousand rubles he came in hurry with three servants the sound of his shoes on the pavement Rahila would sit by the bed, didn't move, her hands on the white stain, satin, weary and proud, pouted her lips like roses, grinned, her, her head uplifted, her almond eyes half open, the shade of her eyelashes on her moonlit cheek, cheeks, and with a dreamy glance, tall, airy, introverted, and aloof, nothing made her happy. In the end of spring, she would sit in the courtyard, sipping her tea on a straw chair under the terrils of lilacs, with pigeons surrounded her feet, white hovering in the trellis. The rain started, then she walked in the garden, and her garments were wet she she looked at the clouds as if she were waiting for somebody she didn't have a friend never answered and did the letters visit or messages Bahab used to look at her through the hatches. Rahila tucked up her skirt, skipping over the brook, soft and agile, pranced and tiptoed on the wet lawn, picked up a rosebud, smelled and pinned it to her hair. She closed her eyes and opened them once more, wandered in the garden for hours. When she became tired, she went to the shade of that big elm tree, then made a house with a rubble stones she she rooted and the grass and squeezed it with her teeth at the end while standing up she ruined the built-up house with the rubble stones tossing over one another on the steep lawn the memory of rahila was deeply moving rahila Rahila's room at the end of the corridor in the north front line had two big windows, one to the garden and the other one to the courtyard and the arbor. The lace curtains had the smell of dust and the perfume of autumn crocuses. When he went to the mirror, his face looked as a stranger. He closed his eyes and wanted Rahila to be alive. Her straight hair spreading around, loose on her shoulders the strands slipped over one another like a flesh of silk now Wahab, tur Wahab turned to a small boy pulling her skirt naughtily the young girl with her very charming eyes would send him off 
He opened the drawers, arranged the perfumes on the dressing table, 1900, from Paris and Moscow, Italian, Chinese, Indian, the long-lasting perfumes of four oceans, Moscan, Bircher and Myrtle, and Black Ambergris. In cosmetics, she had nothing but perfume. There were several bottles in each drawer. He bent down the table took a deep breath he opened the closet his face was lost in the white garments muddy stains flower buttons dry grass and thorn and breads in the dark it turned off the crack of mouth worn boot he tilted his head and closed the door he put the perfume bottles in the right place arranged the pleats of curtains spread the bedspread to the pillows of lace and embroidery he left the room locked the room in the dark corridor walked on the polished parquet and went to the library there were some magazines in a drawer he took them out and turned the pages over he looked at the biography and pictures of Roxana Yashvili. She was a stage actress staring in plays such as Small Bourgeois, One Month in the Village, The Bluebird and Chaika. They called her a white flower, the glimmering of a creative willpower in her eyes. Critics believed she could show the spiritual images and transfer them to the audience, seemingly resembled Rahila. Wahab looked at her pictures in the costumes of Normandy women, in a black velvet dress with a fan in one hand, beneath an arbor, or at the breakfast table while playing with an actor painters had painted her on several canvases, poets had written many poems for her since six years before she had been living in with Marenko, the, the noted poet. There were no pictures of Rahila in the house. When Wahab looked at Roxana's almond and black and glimmering eyes and slim figure, remembered Rahila. She came from Tbilisi with a different nature, noted for her upheavals. Wahab didn't like her complacency, didn't, r didn't read the interviews, just looked at her picture. Just at twelve, Leva climbed down the winding stairs, stepped in the hall, knitted her eyebrows, cross broad shouldered and tall, pale with big lips and a sharp chin and hooked uh, nose, grey eyes, rummaging but lightless, fumbled around, wiggling her backbones pricking in hatred. She was sensitive to heat to heal relief stone even disliked the shape and the name naked and screaming she ran away and fainted on the floor mrs edrisi steered and covered her hanging boobs by a sheet the smell of men revolted Lera. When the workers came for some days to dig the garden or trim the trees or cut the weeds, she she locked herself in the room and didn't came down. A strike of smell made her sick. She opened all the windows. The candelabra moved. In the arcade, the wind blew and howled for two times a day. She took a shower. She had a smell of soap and foam with herself. At night, right after the dinner, she used to brew sour, sour orange blossoms. She stirred it with a little teaspoon. The leaves soaked and spread out. The steam on the cup had a smell of moss and bear moors. She sipped the root beer slowly. In decency and dignity, her lips were not wet. She stood up and very cold and good night in a flower-patterned gown with plate hair a hand on the banister she climbed up the stairs and her pale countenance lost in the dark landing the House of Edrisis is a prominent post-revolutionary novel in Iran by Ghazil Alizadeh, a noted novelist translated from original Persian to English by Rosa Jamali. I'm Rosa Jamali.